Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for um, joining us here at the Vienna Humanities Festival. It's the fourth uh, festival, and uh, I am thrilled. Oh, I should tell you, I'm Mati Banzel. I'm the director of the Wien Museum, and I am absolutely delighted that uh, Laura Engelstein, Professor Laura Engelstein, has um, agreed to join us to talk about uh, a topic that fits our theme of hope and despair quite well, um, or maybe it'll be despair and hope in this case, um, because, um, and I'll talk a little bit about her, she's uh, one of the foremost historians of um, Russia and the Soviet Union, and um, has written extensively and very diversely on the history of those lands, and um, we'll be talking about anti-Semitism, which is one of those topics that um, Russia is sort of, let's say, associated with, and uh, not in a good way, usually, and there's reason for that, and uh, uh, we are gonna basically do something, we're gonna go quite systematically and chronologically, because we're gonna, we're gonna think about anti-Semitism in a, in a general sense first, and then we're gonna think about the, the different periods uh, that uh, have happened, and the history of anti-Semitism in Russia is, if nothing else, intellectually, very exciting because there was ups and downs and really strange conjunctions and quite surprising turns and um, and that is all still going on and that's why we called it anti-Semitism Russia then and now we'll we'll definitely get to the here and now as well but um, let me just uh, complete my introduction so you received your PhD from Stanford um, and uh, you were a professor I guess first at Cornell then at Princeton which is when I first read your work, uh, which was um, a, a book that was very, very important to a lot of us who were uh, starting to do work in the history of sexuality. You wrote an incredible book, The Keys to Happiness, um, Sex and the Search for Modernity in Fantasyakal Russia, at a time when doing this kind of work was sort of at the cusp of respectability. And you were one of the people who paved the way for those of us who are working in, in these kinds of topics, which includes myself. But then after Princeton, you went to Yale and you were a professor at Yale, and uh, you are now currently a resident of Vienna, at least for a couple of months, because you are a fellow at the Institut für die Wissenschaften von Menschen, our partner uh, institution in the Vienna Humanities Festival, and that's fabulous. So now you can be in the festival here. I'll just mention a couple of your other books. I mean, it's very impressive. And, and you know, is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. So your first book was, um, from 1982, Moscow 1905, Working Class Organization and Political Conflict. I already mentioned the book on sex. Um, another book, in, more on folklore, Castration and the Heavenly Kingdom, a Russian folktale. It's also about sex. Yes. Losing it. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> then a very, very important Slavophile Empire, Imperial Russia's Illiberal Path. And uh, then, most recently, in 2017, Russia in Flames, War, Revolution, Civil War, 1914 to 1921. So there is definitely a focus on the late imperial period and the early Soviet period. Yeah, and but a forthcoming book, which I'm just finishing up the proofs, is on anti-Semitism uh, in more or less late 19th, early 20th century, through the Second World War, in three case studies of Russia, Ukraine, and Poland. Um, and so, as a result of actually writing about the Russian Revolution and Civil War, to my surprise, the theme of anti-Semitism and Jews occupied a very central place. Um, yeah. And it didn't start with it, it wasn't supposed to be, uh, I didn't anticipate it. And so I started me thinking about how to think about anti-Semitism and, and in what way I wanted to think about it. So if- That's if, wonderful. If, uh, let me just say, so this is in a sense, we're getting a preview of this book here. Yeah, when, when, when are we going to read it? When, when, when is it coming out? Do it's you know? supposed to come out in March of 2020. Okay, who's, who's going to publish it? it? it they were originally lectures, um, uh, uh, invited lectures at, in, Tel in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Israel, Israel Historical Society has a series of lectures in honor of an uh, Israeli historian. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, my Sorry, God. thank you. <laughs> is this better? Yes. Yeah, okay. Just interrupt me if I'm not doing it right. 
Um, yeah, so there was invited lectures, and this is Coles to Newcastle, as they say. Here I go to Israel and talk about anti-Semitism. Um, but uh, that was the beginning of it, and so I started to um, work on it. And, and so it's being published by Brandeis University Press in conjunction with the Israel Historical Society. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, let's, let's get started. With, okay. um, bef before we get into Russia specifically, and, and also yeah. uh, Poland and Ukraine, um, and I should I should say I'm, I'm, you know full disclosure I I, I I'm kind of a historian of anti-Semitism also although I'm, I'm not an, an expert at all on Eastern Europe but I've done I mean it's, it's kind of like dirty work but someone has to do it the history of anti-Semitism it's not a fun topic but I've done quite a bit on on the work here yeah. in, in, in Vienna and Austria so um, I've done my fair share of thinking about this and uh, all of us who work on this topic are faced with some very, very general questions. Really, let's start with definition. It's not, it's one of those things that everyone talks about, but it's not all that clear how it should be defined, not least because there are different ways to define it. How do you approach it? What is anti-Semitism? What is your definition of anti-Semitism? Okay. So I would have started by saying, yes, there are many books on this subject and many ways of thinking about it. But I have a working definition for my purposes um, as a historian when it comes up in my thinking. And uh, on the one hand, I, I define it or think about it as a way of thinking about the world. It's a structure of thinking. And sometimes, sometimes it's explicitly um, about Jews, um, the conspiracy, the power behind the throne, this, this world controlled by something you cannot see. And of course, because it's about Jews, it impacts directly on actual Jews. It's also a political tool. So in my, in my work, I'm interested in anti-Semitism as a political instrument. When is it used as a mobilizational strategy? How does it work to, to oppose other political positions or so on and so forth. So in, in thinking about how it appears in Russian history, it seems to me that it appears, it, it appears as an element in moments of political crisis or particular political conjunctures where it becomes particularly um, important or active. This is not the same thing and it's not addressing the question of is it embedded in the culture? So this idea that Russia is somehow there's a kind of cultural a DNA, DNA right. that it's, it's intrinsically or culturally anti-Semitic, uh, or Ukraine all the more so, or Poland, you know, in the third degree, <laughs> the nth degree or something like that. I prefer to think of it, and I'm not taking a position on the question of how it does get to work through the culture, and of course it is cultural also. I'm interested in how it functions politically. So in my thinking about Russia, and, and I think this is a, actually, an optimistic way of thinking about anti-Semitism, because all sorts of prejudices flow through the culture, but they're not always active. They don't always have consequences. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Th this is a really important point because, because um, I mean, one of the ways that I try to organize the vast research that's being done on, on anti-Semitism and the history of anti-Semitism in you know globally or in specific uh, places, it seems to me there are those historians who more or less think of anti-Semitism as an eternal, eternal phenomenon. It, it just like, it's, it's it, and I think the, the phrase it's in the DNA is, is really an apt one. Or in the Christian, or in the Christian DNA, exactly. the Christian tradition that from, from the very beginning, right. and you can't really get rid of it. Right. Or in the German culture, or, or in German the, or culture. In, and you don't take that position. I don't think it's useful to think about it that way. And I think I'm, I'm, as a historian of the modern period, I'm interested in seeing how this functions. And I'm, and I'm not going backward to the beginning to see, right. although it is also the case that the fact that it has been connected to certain forms of, of Christian right. mobilization or Christian church-related activism, particularly in the Russian context, yep. is important. But I also want to add, the church is not just a spiritual institution, it's a political institution. Right. And the moments in which this kind of church-sponsored uh, anti-Semitism mm -hmm. comes into play may have something to do with the long line of Christian uh, anti-Semitism. Yeah. And there is an, an intellectual history of Russia at the turn of the century, a very strong current of actually quite progressive neo-Orthodox thinkers who think of anti-Semitism as an important part of the Christian tradition. As a good thing. You know. As a good thing. Well, as an inevitable thing. Most of them are opposed political anti-Semitism. Yeah. So that's a whole other subject. And yeah. it's a subject that's important. I've worked, thought about it. Uh, so I guess, in conclusion, I would say anti-Semitism, 
operates on different levels, often simultaneously. And when you're thinking about it, you can, I can't give you, yeah. I don't think there is actually a one word answer to the question. Um, let me, let's get to Russia and Eastern Europe by way of comparison to the, to the German history. And I'm going to give you my completely reductive um, view that in the history of anti-Semitism in the German world, German-speaking world, whether it's Germany itself or, or Austria, we tend to distinguish between an older form of antagonism that is sometimes called anti-Judaism from a modern form of antagonism which we call anti-Semitism. Not all of us do, but many of us do. Anti-Judaism would be the long-standing Christian tradition of seeing a problem with the Jews from a purely theological point of view. As you all know, Christianity emerges out of Judaism in its self-understanding. Uh, it's essentially Judaism, but Jesus Christ is recognized as the Messiah who was prophesied in Judaism, and uh, that's Christianity. And Judaism is the very annoying remnant of those people who don't get that. And by and large, anti-Judaism, the religious tradition of anti-Judaism that you know, goes back arguably to the beginning of Christianity, um, is an, an attempt, let's say, to convince the Jews in one form or another to basically get with the program. Anti-Semitism in the German-speaking world is a modern invention of the Enlightenment where the hostility against Jews is no longer over their religious incalcitrance, but has to do with a conception of the Jews as an alien body who are unassimilable and could never become purely German. So let, let, me, let me just set you up for, 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 you can totally deconstruct all of that. But the question is, is that a structure, maybe you don't agree with it, which would be fabulous, or is it a structure that holds or does not hold in Eastern Europe? Well, I'm gonna change the, I'm going to answer it in a different way, which is, <clears throat> as I understand it, and I'm not a German historian, anti-Semitism became political more or less in the 1870s in conjunction, in conjunction with the unification of Germany, the reign of Bismarck, and a shift in the political situation, political intellectual situation in Germany. And this is where we have the coining of the word anti-Semitism, and Treitschke comes out as an anti-Semite, and there's a big scandal, and so on. And here, hello, surprise. Where do the Russians get their ideas? Where do they get their theories? Who are they reading? The Russian intellectuals who are producing ideology are all reading all the Europeans. They know the Germans inside out. They read German. It's not an isolated island up there in Antarctica. It's part of the Euro European cultural uh, spectrum. So the question of let's compare. One thing that's going on is it's connected. And, and anti-Semitism in Russia, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which are produced uh, at the end of the 19th century, some forgery, this is the famous forgery that claims that the Jews have a, there's a cons, cons, conciliary, cons, con, no, a concilium, <laughs> a, uh, association of the elders of Jews who are trying to control the world, this powerful hidden, this is this, this is what I call a structure of thinking, a, a way of seeing the world, and the Jews, which are operating behind the scenes, are a fantasy. This is a phantasm, these Jews. Of course, they're also real Jews. So what I, I'm trying to say, and this is an interesting problem for a historian, you have a pan-European intellectual political development in the emergence of anti-Semitism as a political factor, but you also have local political developments. Russia didn't have Bismarck, it had other things. So as a Russian historian, I say, when are the little, uh, little sparks, when are the crisis points? We have an ideology that is unfolding, not on its own, but in connection, and yet there are local moments. And so as everyone knows, I think, who knows anything about Russian history, 1881. Okay, 1881? The Tsar Liberator, Alexander II, what a nice guy, he frees the serfs, but it's not enough, so there are a bunch of radicals and really a handful. He's assassinated in 1881, which sparks off a series of pogroms. Pogrom, what's a pogrom? A pogrom in Russian comes from a word which means, the word for grom, which is thunder, which is smashing, which is 
uh, just general word for destruction, which becomes associated with, comes associated with the destruction of Jews. So this is a big wave of pogroms. Pogroms becomes an international world, word. It is encouraged, it is instigated as a reaction by ideologues in defense of autocracy in reaction to a moment in which revolutionaries of whom one had a Jewish last name, it was not in the name of the Jews, by the Jews, by any strike of us stretch of the imagination. So we have this first really worldwide notorious outbreak of pogroms, attacks on actual Jews. Then there's a moment in 1903, the Kishinev pogrom, there was an economic crisis, there were strikes, and again, they were right-wing ideologues, abetted, encouraged by the Tsar to foment anti-Semitism. 1905 revolution, big challenge to authority, big political crisis, again, organization on the right. The Jews, one of the myths, two myths, that all the Jews emigrated from Russia because of the 1881 pogroms, not true. They had emigrated mostly because they were poor, because they were confined to certain places of living, and they were fed up with certain kinds of restrictions, like residential restrictions. Only with a certain amount of education could you move to the big city, and so on. But the Jews believed that the Tsar was behind the pogroms. It's not true. He wasn't behind them. He was a beautiful anti-Semite. He had no problem being an anti-Semite. But he was also an autocrat, and he didn't want mob rule, and he didn't want mass violence. He was not behind it. On the other hand, he was very encouraging to these right-wing organizations in the street, mobilizing the masses, or the, and so on, against the revolution. 1905, crisis. The Bayless case, if anyone has heard of it, in which the Ministry of Justice of the Tsarist Empire promotes the blood libel, the Jews murder Christian children in order to suck the blood, to break the moths, and so on. So there is a direct association between the ideology of the autocracy and the violence against Jews. So I'm just saying, Germany has its crisis moments, Russia has its crisis moments. This is an available worldview, an available ideology, which gets activated at certain times. I'm kind of arguing, I guess you get the point, that it's not, if it's not in the bloodstream, it's around, it's available, and this is where, when it shows up. This is totally fascinating, and it, it, it to me begs the question, and, and this is where, I'm where I need your help, because I, I really don't know this, this history. Um, so your focus is on, and I'm, it's totally persuasive, that it's sort of, it's, it's not in the DNA, but it's an available trope. It's, um, it's something that can be used politically for strategic, strategic yeah. reasons. And um, you, you focus on the late imperial period, late 19th century, and the very beginning of the 20th century. Just so I understand, what, what, what came before? I mean, and the reason I ask this is, for example, I don't fully understand um, what, for example, the, 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 the thinking about Jews was in, in the Russian Orthodox Church, quite apart from any kind of modern political state building, imperial politics, etc. Okay, I can only answer that question in a partial way. First of all, it was the case that in the earlier early 19th century, there were cases of blood libel in the Russian Empire. So not the first one in 1911. They're already there, and this is before the 1870s, before anti-Semitism really becomes political in that way. That happens. I can't actually answer the question about the Russian Orthodox Church from the inside in the early period. Um, in the turn of the century period, the Orthodox Church was definitely uh, a defender of autocracy. It was the state church, um, al although Judaism was recognized as one of the official re religions of the Russian Empire, uh, even though there were discriminatory law laws against the Jews. Um, but. Uh, in the long span, actually, in the beginning, Maddie asked me to talk about Russia today. <laughs> so uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. We, we have yeah, time. We'll but but one of the th questions you always ask is, where is the church at a given moment? Um, I can't answer the question theologically going way back. I know that in the turn of the century, serious Russian thinkers who were grappling with the legacy of Russian orthodoxy um, felt like anti-Semitism was a valid component, anti-Semitism in the theological sense. The Jews 
are not, we can't be pluralistic. It's okay to be Christian and it's, we have a duty to be anti-Semitic in that sense. And they said that. We don't believe in pogroms, we believe they have civil rights and the rest of it, but we have a, a spiritual duty to be anti-Semitic. Um, mm -hmm. So that's as far as I'll go. I can't, I actually don't know church history. Maybe Kate can help us step in here. Um, the, the earlier preceding history of the church, internal history. Are they even interested in the question? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, in, in uh, that, that's it's very spotty in the in the in the German tradition as well, because there there are times when Jews play very little role, and at other times, they, again, they're sort of mobilized. Let's get back to the to the to this moment of, of of imperial modern imperial politics. So I'm trying to understand the pogroms because they are huge. I mean, and and, and I, I take not, you. They're not huge yet. No, 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 no. I, I was gonna say, I was gonna say <laughs> they're huge in our thinking about yeah. the history of anti-Semitism, Jews, and you're actually yes. making a very, very radical point that they're not actually that big. Um, they're I, not that big, but you're right. They make a big splash. Yes. 1881, inter let me tell you this, the anti-Semites had one thing right. It was true, is true, that Jews, Jews without borders, you could call them, uh, mobilized internationally to address world public opinion and mobilize resources and actually send help. Uh, these, these Jewish institutions, organizations, they form around the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit late, mm -hmm. but public opinion, the press, wealthy Jews in the United States, they intervene. They make a fuss. So yeah, 1881 yeah. in retrospect doesn't look as big as the later waves of pogroms. Yeah. But and I say this, that I'm, it's a joke, right? Jews, yes, mobilize on their own behalf, not to control the world, but to defend the fact that Jews Fellow elsewhere Jews, are yeah. being attacked. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But, but so what I'm trying to understand is, and I take your point completely, and it's utterly persuasive to me that, that anti-Semitism doesn't, even, even if it's available as an idea, actual anti-Semitic acts, let alone violence, have a political reason in a way, or a political um, logic. Yeah, logic, okay. But, what is that political logic? What, what, what political actor wants to further what political goal by having pogroms? This is a great question. So one of the major moments of anti-Semitic mobilization and in fact damage, uh, damage inflicted on the Jewish population was the First World War. Mm -hmm. And as we know, all the countries, all the combatant countries, there's a big upsurge in xenophobic propaganda mm -hmm. because you have actual enemies, right? Someone's out there with an army and guns and trying to do you harm. And, and anti anti xenophobic propaganda, the hidden enemy, so resident aliens and so on. There was an anti-Semitic component in all these countries. Belgium, Britain, France, you name it, and made big time in, uh, in Russia, in the Russian Empire. So you ask, what's the purpose, right? So in the First World War, uh, there was a problem with authority in the Russian Empire, so the, the Army High Command had absolute control over the, all the Western provinces. So these are the, these are the overlap provinces. They're, they're neighboring with Germany, who is actually is the enemy. Uh, Jews are on both sides. They speak this funny language, which sounds a lot like German because it is a lot like German. Um, they are intermediaries. They are commercial people. You cannot trust them, and so on. And this is perfect for an anti-Semitic worldview. So the army, the army, promotes anti-Semitic explicit propaganda and also a policy of expelling, um, uh, dis expropriating, driving into the interior, the Jewish population of the Western provinces. So it's not exactly pogroms, but it's a massive, officially sponsored persecution program. What is the response in St. In St. Petersburg, in Petrograd by this time it's called? The civilian ministers are appalled. They're all anti-Semites, so what's the purpose, you ask? They say this is a self-destructive policy. This is tearing our society apart. Three million refugees in the interior. We can barely cope with the war as it, as it is. What is the purpose? Interesting. So what is the purpose of all of this uh, xenophobic propaganda? There were attacks on Germans, the domestic German, and so on and so forth. There were a lot, by the way, of German populations uh, in, in, in racinated, rooted in Russian society in Imperial Russia. Okay, so sometimes you ask yourself, is there a purpose? Is it self-defeating all the time? What, what does it mean to have a purpose? It's mobilizational, it's inspirational, it's supposed to stimulate patriotism and so on. And it plays on this kind of groundwater 
this available prejudices and suspicions. Because we have to remember that in the Pale of Settlement, all these populations lived side by side in a kind of symbiosis. If you see anyone here knows uh, Sholem Aleichem Tevye the Milkman, the story of an ordinary Jewish milkman. Which becomes the, f Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler on the Roof is the American sentimental version of this. And at one moment, the, the local policeman comes over and he says, we're really sorry, but we have to commit a pogrom, so please get out of the way for tomorrow we're having a pogrom. And this is supposed to symbolize the fact that under normal circumstances, things were pretty okay in a village. Um, actually, I can cite the memories of my own grandfather who grew up in a little village in Bessarabia at the turn of the century, and the priest was helping him get a, a little education, even though mm -hmm. he wasn't supposed to be in the schoolhouse because he was a, a Jew, and the priest helped him organize this and that when they needed to, and everything was really quite fine uh, on the level of everyday life. So you ask about the church. Um, so. Uh, what am I saying? I lost my train of thought We're, here. we're trying to get to the purpose of it all, but the purpose, there, maybe yeah, there is, is the no purpose? purpose. What is the purpose of it all? It's mobilizational. It turns people against their neighbors where they would be likely to do just fine. And of course, in wartime, Russia was invaded in the First World War, right? And, and it was true that there were Polish speakers on both sides of the border. And it was true there were German speakers on both sides of the border. And it was true that these Jews were smugglers and, and contrabandists and so on. Um, and the Jews had a good reason to resent the Russian Empire because of the way they had been treated. So, uh, but the purpose in this case, and this is my reading, and I'm actually echoing what was said at the time, it was self-defeating. It helped destroy the Tsarist Empire from within. Interesting, very, very interesting. Moving on in time, as we historians like to do. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, in a way, things do seem to get quite a bit better with the revolution, because why? Well, first of all, they get dramatically better when the provisional government comes to power. So as everyone must know, in February 1917, the army's not functioning, the massive protests and so on and so forth. The Tsar loses his charisma. His generals and his ministers come up and say, time to go, Nikki, <laughs> sign on the dotted line, no more Tsar then what do you do? So it had, there had been a parliament after 1905, and there were liberals who wanted to have a Western-style constitutional mm -hmm. government, and the first thing they did was they abolished all discriminatory, discriminatory legislation for religious belief. The Jews are suddenly have the same civil rights as everybody else. And, and this, is, this is literally the first moment in Russian history that Jews are on absolute equal legal footing. Well, we have to say it a little bit differently because there was no absolute legal footing for anybody in the Russian Empire. Yeah. They, everyone had a, yeah. there wasn't yeah. general civil rights, yeah. there were, yeah. and so yeah. on and so forth. So the Jews, but the Jews also had special, suffered under special discriminatory yeah. legislation. Yeah, Jews like everybody else, civil rights, citizenship, yeah. elections, and so on. This is February by the old calendar, March by the European calendar, to October, November, when the Bolsheviks take over. And then we're in a new ball game. And the Bolsheviks are in the spirit of the Enlightenment. This is yeah. social democracy. Yeah. This is equality and, of course, separation of church and state. That was also the position. I should point out this is irrelevant to this panel, but women also got the vote under the provisional government. The Bolsheviks were not the authors of this uh, change, the idea of equal citizenship and so on. So what happens? The October Revolution, just like the 1905 Revolution, unleashes a massive counter-revolutionary backlash. And just like in, after 1905, after October 1917, you have a mobilization on the right. In this case, you have a military mobilization by the officers of the former Imperial Army mm -hmm. who gather in the South, and they mobilize under the banner of among other things, anti-Semitism. Not all of them are monarchists, not all of them are anti-Semites. Some of them actually are Democrats and think of themselves as defending the February Revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they allow and accept, General Dinikin in particular, anti-Semitism, and they ally with very aggressively anti semitism their officers. This is the tradition. And the army had been, under the imperial regime, a hotbed of anti-Semitism. So okay. that policy during the First World War is not an outlier when it comes to the Russian imperial army. And they're in that tradition. Um, so the Civil War is complicated. And just to go quick, quick, there's some really interesting paradoxes here. Um, 
the Bolsheviks, of course, oppose anti-Semitism in principle. Mm -hmm. Um, and, they believe they're, and guess what? They are, of all the forces involved in the Civil War, whatever you don't like about the Bolsheviks, they, put, they not only accepted Jews into their ranks, they allowed them to occupy positions of great authority. Who was the commissar of war for the Bolsheviks, for the new Soviet regime during the Civil War? Leon Bernstein Trotsky, who had been and continued to be the hottest symbol of Jewish domination and Jewish evil for the white opposition to the Bolsheviks for anti-Semites. He was the incarnation. He's the commissar of war. This is just fine, okay? Um, Be because, I mean, just to understand from the, the, the position of the Bolsheviks, would have, I mean, they were not sort of pluralists in a multicultural contemporary sense, right? They, 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 they sort of, they accepted him even though that was his background, or no, am I wrong no, about no, that? No, 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 no. They were, they were opposed to religion. They were okay. opposed to religious difference. They were secular. So quickly, quickly, I see we're running out of time. <laughs> Things are not so rosy because, um, well, first of all, it has to be said, in the, in the Russian Civil War, there are various different movements. You have breakaway nationalism. The, uh, the aggressively nationalist movements have more trouble with anti-Semitism than the, than the Soviet, the reestablishment of a central Russian regime. Polish nationalism was associated with anti-Semitism from before the First World War. This is not a reaction to the Russian Revolution. 1912, the National Democrats under uh, Roman Moski, they proudly, we gotta get rid of these Jews, they're suffocating us to death, they do not belong in Poland, they are not Polish, and this remains a constant feature all the way through the Polish, whatever you know, honorable reasons there are for the establishment of the new Polish state, this was part of their ideology, unapologetically. Ukraine is more complicated. Pitlura often stands in as a symbol of anti-Semitism. Pitlura was the head of the wannabe new Ukrainian nation. Pitlura was not an anti-Semite, he was a socialist. Everyone around him was an anti-Semite. His troops were responsible in his name for the vast majority of the pogroms. And here's where we really hit the top when it comes to pogroms. Something between 65,000 and 150,000 maybe more than that, Jews were murdered in the wave of pogroms as armies swept back and forth across the Western provinces, Ukraine. There was no strong political authority. Everybody took advantage of the use of irregular forces, these kind of um, chieftains and so on. And here you get, uh, a, a, as a mobilizational ideology, anti-Semitism was very powerful. Even the Bolsheviks allied with some of these nasty characters. They needed them. No one had a very strong army. You could say, we can do without you yet. But the Bolshevik position was pretty, pretty firm. I just want to jump ahead a little because I want to make a point before we run out of time. Um, in well, the we're, not, we're not close the, to being. In the 1920s, so the Soviet period starts with great hopes, and many Jews signed up for the in support of the new Soviet regime because it symbolized the end of discrimination and the possibility of entering in, of having authority, of being part of the system. And they also believed in the ideals, but it was good for the Jews. At the same time, the Bolsheviks operated with a kind of worldview that was very similar to anti-Semitism in one important way. It, it believed, it was, it mobilized in terms of the assault on enemies, on whole classifications of people, the bourgeoisie the white guard. And these were not always, for one thing, directly descriptive of the populations they were supposed to be designating. Mm -hmm. So who was a bourgeois? Is it a little guy who's selling you candy on the corner? Is it someone who owns a factory? Is it someone who wears an overcoat and you don't have an overcoat? Is it somebody who wears glasses and you don't have glasses? And so this whole mobilization, the class war, which the Bolsheviks, it was literally, and it was a class war, because guess what? The enemies were armed against them. So. Some of these positions, which were targeted by communist ideology, were occupied by Jews. So who was the petty trader? And who, traitor, trader, Both. D, trader, <laughs> not traitor, trader. Who was the petty trader? Who was the merchant? Who was, and so on. It was sometimes and very often a Jew. And sometimes the people who were kind of sent out to battle against the bourgeoisie thought of themselves actually as 
battling the same person they would have battled anyway, who happened to be Jewish. So it wasn't a moment that was particularly safe for Jews in certain social positions. And in the 1920s, when the Bolsheviks shifted from the Civil War to the new economic policy, which brought back the marketplace, it brought back speculation. It brought back instant riches. And the speculator became an archetypal figure denounced as the speculator. And often the speculator either was Jewish, imagined as Jewish. So it wasn't exactly safe territory for mm -hmm. the Jews, even though ideologically the Soviet regime was certainly neutral. No, it was against anti-Semitism. Right. It denounced anti-Semitism. There was a complete separation of church and state. And the other thing that was a problem for the Jews, as for many other people at the end of the 1920s, even before Stalin, is the campaign against religion across the board. So Jewish organizations, associations, synagogues, and so on, are targeted along with everybody else, so right. it wasn't anti-Semitic. It's anti not anti-Semitic, it's just anti-religious. It's not anti-Semitic, but if you open the pages of the main journal of the anti-religion anti campaign mm -hmm. in the 1920s, Bizboznik, mm -hmm. and you see the cartoons, you say, whoo, what am I looking at? It's anti -Semitic. These, these look very much like anti-Semitic cartoons. So what I'm trying to say is these two kind of, these two patterns of thinking, these two styles of thought, very dangerously sometimes overlap. Um, what, what then happens when Stalin really takes over? I mean, is that, I mean, because officially that, that same, the same pattern holds. I mean, even under Stalin, official anti-Semitism does, officially anti-Semitism is being opposed. Until, the, official anti-Semitism until the Second World War. But there's also something called coded anti-Semitism. For example, the 1920s begins the great co campaign against Trotskyism, mm -hmm. against Trotsky. Within the Bolshevik so, sphere. Yeah. As many of you probably know if you're in this room to begin with, <laughs> the big competition in the 1920s was who was going to be the su Succeed. successor mm -hmm. to, to Lenin who dies in 1924. So the, the rivalry between Stalin and Trotsky, and, and Trotsky becomes the target of Stalinist venom and this whole campaign. Trotsky, as I mentioned already, was the archetypal symbol of the Jew, the Jew with power. Mm -hmm. And you didn't need a translation, right? You, Trotsky, and, and it's been argued more forcefully recently in some recent work in the field that this really was understood, in a sense, as an anti-Semitic campaign, although obviously okay. it was the word yeah, was would never have been used part of it. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the Stalin period uh, has very distinct moments in it as well um, mm -hmm. when it comes to anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. even after the 1920s. This is still, we're talking about the 1920s. But, but what, what are those key moments? I mean, when, when I, th because I think of, I mean, in the classic question, less among historians than within Jewish communities, the question is, was it good for the Jews? I mean, Stalin was not good for the Jews. Right. Stalin wasn't good for anybody. <laughs> I, think that's, 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 I think that's a very profound statement. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's but let's, let's ask this one. Was it particularly bad for the Jews or not that bad? bad. Um, it was particularly bad for the Jews at particular moments. <laughs> um, and uh, um, one thing about the 1930s is, and here you have to say, how do we parse this? How do mm -hmm. we disentangle? The 1930s is, of course, the decade of the Great Purges in which Stalin uh, as murders, has murdered the leaders of his own party, the people who were, and many of whom were Jewish, precisely ironically because Jews were allowed into the leadership and had a reason to, be, to support the, the Bolshevik movement. That was not specifically against the Jews. And then we have World War II, right? So first we have a, a pact with uh, Hitler, and then we turn around and we don't have a pact with Hitler. Um, and in the Second World War, Stalin does a couple of interesting things. He reanimates Russian nationalism. He allows the church to have a voice once again. And again, the thinking behind this is to, is to stimulate patriotic feeling for the Soviet Union beyond all the, the Soviet-style patriotism that had also continued, continued to be promoted. And among other things, uh, Stalin, and here I like to think of this as the inversion of the anti-Semitic obsession with Jewish worldwide networks. Stalin organizes what he called the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, right. in which he brought together the leaders, cultural leaders of Soviet, let me put it this way, leaders of prominent figures in Soviet culture who self-identified as Jews or were identified as Jews. And here's one point to be made about Soviet society in general. On your passport, there was right. the Piati Punk, the fifth point, nationality, nationality, meaning ethnic, ethnic. In, in their language. 
you had to choose. And so you were Jewish, whether you self-identified or not. Um, some Jews, we have to ask yourself, what did it mean to be Jewish in a secular society? But you were identified as Jewish. In any case, self-identified or regime-identified Jews who were known to be Jewish, Ilya Ehrenburg, uh, Vasily Grossman, uh, Solomon Mikhail, so the theater director was the head of it, uh, and they were sent to the United States, they were sent abroad to mobilize Jewish support for the Soviet effort against the Nazis in the Second World War. And it has to be said, good for the Jews, bad for the Jews, the Soviets were a major part of the victory over uh, Stalin. And those Jews which, who were deported, for example, Polish Jews who were deported or fled into the interior of the Soviet Union were survived. many times more likely to survive. In fact, most of the Polish Jews who did survive, survived because they were... Right. So the, that, the, the war is interesting. Immediately after the war, Stalin cracks down on this same Jewish anti-fascist committee. He does not permit the publication of the findings that they gathered on the persecution of the Jews during the war. He arrests the leaders and dozens of other Jewish prominent culture and has them executed in 1951, 19, uh, 1951, 1953. Uh, 19, already 1948, Mikhail's has been assassinated. Um, I'm losing the date here. So this is a, a massive turnaround. Um, the Stalin regime, after the war, the post-war, the Soviet regime never really acknowledged the specific uh, toll taken on the Jewish population. 10% of the 2.7 million victims of the Second World War on Soviet territory were Jewish, um, which in comparison to about 2% of the pre-war Soviet population. But the specific toll on the Jewish population was never publicly accept, uh, acknowledged. acknowledged, identified. They were just victims in, of the war. Just Soviet victims of the war and so on. So that was part of the sort of uh, quashing. And then, of course, as everyone knows, it, right before he died, Stalin activated the so-called doctor's plot in which he accused Jewish doctors of having assassinated uh, on the day Erzdanov, the uh, party secretary, and had them arrested. And it was only Stalin's death in 1953 that stopped this. So the end of Stalinism, in a most literal sense, was not good for the Jews. Um, so, but I guess I'm trying to say, I hope I'm not being too complicated here in my storytelling. There's a lot of in and out, up and down uh, complexity uh, when you talk about the Soviet Union. So like the Russian Empire, it get a really bad reputation even in the post-Stalin period, right? Mm -hmm. Not only for not acknowledging the toll of the war on the Jews, but for, again, reactivating anti-Semitism. What also, of course, happens right after the war is, is the founding of the State of Israel. What, how does that play into the equation? Because the Soviet Union, I think initially was for the partition, but then quite quickly turns anti-Zionist officially. The Soviet Union was the first country to de jure recognize Israel. I was right. interested, I looked right. this up. Um, uh, Austria, not till nine, that's, so 1948, okay. May, I think 1948. Austria and France, 1949. Germany, okay. not till 1965, interestingly enough. Really? Okay. Britain, de facto, then later de jure. So, there's a reason, I'm not quite sure why, some geopolitical reason mm -hmm. for Stalin having to do with the politics of the Middle East, the relationship mm -hmm. with Britain. Um, but uh, what becomes the new form of anti-Semitism after the 1967 war and so on is anti-Zionism. So anti-Zionism is another cover for anti-Semitism and then there are restrictions, uh, educational restrictions, entry to higher education, uh, restrictions on, of course, no one could leave the country freely. And what became in the Western media the big deal was the restriction on emigration uh, in the 1970s. The result of all this was that between 1971 and um, today, 1.6 million self-identified Jews left what had been the Soviet Union. Um, about two-thirds of them ended up in Israel, and a friend of mine who's Israeli t tells me that Putin refers to them as our people. Um, there are only, according to reliable statistics, a half a million self-identified Jews in the post-Soviet states, That's it. whereas you have a new diaspora of 1.6 million or something like that. Um, in Israel, um, 
over 100,000 in Germany, uh, half a million in, I guess, the United States and Canada. Um, so what's happening now, and I was also really surprised to sort of catch up on the latest literature, if you go up and down, the thaw, the stagnation, Brezhnev, and so on, and we get to the end of communism, and the 1990s are kind of shocking, because on the one hand, democracy, Yeltsin, chaos, and the fringe, anti-Semitism comes out of the woodwork. You couldn't stand up on the street in the Soviet Union with a pamphlet to saying, Jews rule the world, you know, beat the Jews. Uh, couldn't do it. And you could do it in the 1990s, and they did. There were okay. all these pamphlets and newspapers and right wing, this and that mobilization. Under Perestroika, same thing, fringe, but under Perestroika, the Jews started to recreate their associations, their synagogues opening, and so on. So a Jewish life reappears, even though there are not many Jews anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but since Putin, love him or hate him, Anti-Semitism is not an official ideology. It's not an official ideology in, in Ukraine. Um, there's even a law against the instigation of intra-ethnic hatred on the books. At the same time, 2002, this is when Solzhenitsyn published his uh, notorious 200 years together, rather anti-Semitic history of the Jews in, in, in Russian history. Um, it's a period in which the church uh, associated with uh, Putin joins him in formulating ideologies of patriotic nationalism in which there is some kind of intrinsic Russian civilization pitted against the West. And the West is often depicted as somehow this not only um, somehow anti-Christian but also Jewish. So they're, again, they're the co coded forms of anti-Semitism associated again with the church and somewhat suspiciously with Putin's kind of mobilizational patriotism, but not explicit, and it's certainly not official ideology in, in contemporary Russia. There's not this kind of anti-liberal anti backlash anti-Semitism, the kind of thing you find in, in Hungary, for example. And there may be many reasons for that, not all so positive as, for example, uh, the nature of Russian civil society or political life uh, today. But um, um, I think one has to, looking at the long span of Russian history, get away from the stereotype, Russia anti-Semitic. And uh, with more time and <laughs> details, one would want to ask the kind of question that you asked before. Let's compare it to other places in specific historical moments. In what ways is it different? In what ways is it hooked up with more worldwide trends or at least European-wide trends? I want to open it up to questions in a second, but um, I, you know, this is this is a festival, so we're we're I, I, I'm gonna ask a question, and, and if you don't want to answer, that's that's perfectly fine. But um, how did you get interested in Russia? Um, because I mean. I mean, you. I mean, I'm trying to, to do. I mean, it must have been the height of the Cold War, when you went to college and grad school, and it was not even. Was it even possible to to go to the Soviet Union as an American to do research in the archives? Well, the, the very easy question of how I got into it is because my grandfather got out of it. <laughs> so. Uh, it was really a family. My parents were born in Eastern Europe, so my father was born in Galicia in 1920 in a spot that had been Austria two years before, which made him Polish rather than Austrian. Uh, my mother was born in Bessarabia also in 1920, and in 1921 crossed the river with her family at the age of one okay. into what had become Romania. <laughs> okay. um, and they made it to New York in 1930. So I grew up in a Yiddish-speaking, classic Jewish family um, from Eastern Europe. So that's how I personally got into it. Oh, what was the second question? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, were you able to do research? Oh, research, in the, yeah. In the so in my own life, um, uh, in graduate school, I would spend the year 1973 to 1974 in Moscow on an official scholarly exchange as a graduate student. That was possible for Americans oh, yeah. at the time? No, no, even okay. in the 1960s they began. And it was perfectly, it was, a, everyday life was perfectly normal. I was very, I am now very glad I was there. This was the year of the Yom Kippur War. This was the year Solzhenitsyn was expelled. This was sort of classic Brezhnev era. And I experienced it. And that's very important to, to how I feel about what came later. Uh, my students go to a different world, different country, different relationship to that particular territory. Um, so I have a real visceral sense of what that was. Uh, I didn't suffer. I suffered in one way. I suffered academically. 
you could go to the library, you could go to the archive, but you couldn't really get what you needed. It was difficult. It was, they were not interested in having some Jewish, I didn't have to say I was Jewish, I just showed up. <laughs> um, I mean, your name was recognizable My name, my face, to, the way yeah. I speak okay. Russian, they didn't have to ask a question. They're not going to give me, I wrote my dissertation on the 1905 revolution. So that was not the fun part of it. Um, but yeah, it w but the difference is, from the generation of my students, they go to Russia, they spend half a year, they have a job, they're speaking Russian. Um, so what I have, they don't have, is this inside myself historical experience of yeah. history, which it happens with the passage of time. You know, my parents, I didn't have the experience my parents had, whatever. So. What, what did your parents think of, of you going to the Soviet Union to, to become a historian of Russia and the Soviet Union? Um, my parents were not anti-Russian. Uh, my parents were also not anti-German. They were actually quite enlightened people. They were socialists. They were anti-Stalinist socialists. They both still believed that there was a good thing uh, to be gotten out of the social democratic tradition. They were highly educated in Hebrew and Yiddish and they were secular. They couldn't find a way to still maintain a Jewish tradition that was not embedded in the old style of religion, which is a difficult choice, but I understand why they made it. Um, they were very, they lived in New York, they were very European, they spoke foreign languages, they were read a lot. They thought it was great. They thought it was great that I was a historian, that I was pursuing an academic career. They had an enormous respect for learning and education, and, um, and they read my books. Of course, they criticized them. <laughs> <laughs> like all Jewish parents, what did you do in chapter two? <laughs> <laughs> well, what did, did they dislike something substantive, or was it just your phrase? No, phrasing? my father said, why did you put the boring chapters first? <laughs> you know, Jewish father. <laughs> I can't complain about my parents. I was pretty lucky. <laughs> and, and back to, I mean, I'm fascinated. So you're, you're, you're an American graduate student, American Jewish, coded as Jewish in, in the Russian and the Soviet yeah. tradition in Moscow. How, I mean, was that, was, were you deeply conscious of that? I was... Of what? Of being, of, of, of being constructed as a, a Jew, possibly not getting archival sources. No, no. I was not getting archival sources because I was an American, okay. not because I was Jewish. And most of the approaches to me as Jewish were for friendly approaches. Like someone trying to figure out whether it was really what they thought I was as a way of approaching me. Like someone who was also Jewish, for ah, example. Okay, okay, so, okay. so I would naively say, oh, I'm American. Oh, that's not what we mean. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was, yeah, it was, I, I did not suffer in 1973-74 personally. I was, had some acquaintances among in Russian intellectuals and I had a sense of how they were experiencing this moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, it was also the year that the gulag was smuggled into, Solzhenitsyn's gulag archipelago wow. was smuggled into the Soviet Union. Wow. Um, Did you smuggle it? I plead the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> 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 so um, I would say uh, it was the height of my own personal American patriotism, which was centered on the cafeteria in the American embassy. <laughs> wow. Otherwise, um, oh, this is so fascinating. Yeah. Um, we do have a couple of minutes. Are there questions from the audience? Yes. Wait, wait, we have a, we have a microphone. No, because we're recording, that's why. Yeah. Is there anything in Russia similar to the American far-right religious Christian Zionism? I don't know if you would call it philo-Semitism. Is there anything similar to that in Russia? Whether there's philo-Semitism? Yeah, in a, in a sense, in America, you have the far right that's Christian Zionist, very pro-Israel, Jews are the chosen people, and all of this kind of thing uh, uh, that's going on in Texas and the South. It's a wonderful question. Uh, and is there anything like that in Russia? Or historically, has there been anything like that? I'm not, I, I'm not an expert. I, I'm not aware of it. I, I'm afraid I can't answer the question. I don't know. That's an interesting question. I really don't know. I mean, maybe the Russian right-wingers are properly anti-Semitic. No, 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 I'm just... I don't, it is, it is no, quite no. confusing because the, the, the American no. far right, I mean, is aggressively pro-Israel and thinks of itself as aggressively pro-Jewish. Well, and, I'll and just, I'll, I'll switch the subject a little bit because Orban is a really wonderful, interesting combination, which he is pro-Israel, anti-Muslim and big on the anti-Soros 
coded and not so coded anti-Semitism, world capitalism, conspiracy kind of style of thinking. So he combines, this is, a, this is not religious, this is political. But I think in order to answer the question properly, I would have to know more about the current Russian church and Russian religious thinking, and I, I just simply don't. There's one question there and one question there. Um, well, uh, I've come across this form of uh, what, what uh, is portrayed by people as uh, anti-imperialism, it's anti-American quite frequently, and it's not peculiar just to Eastern Europe, um, which in my view is just plain and clear anti-Semitism, but coded as anti-Americanism. So it's always turned against America, but basically if you replaced it by the Jews, the Jew or the Jewish comp conspiracy, it would be the classical uh, anti-Semitism. And I wonder, of course there's a lot to be said about the American presence all around the world, but how does it come that this is works so well and not just in uh, the former Russian Empire, but much into, let's say, around here in Europe. Uh, is this um, because it's promoted so well or um, is there another reason which I cannot, uh, cannot grasp? I think one, another way of formulating that question would be what does it add to make Jews the target? Because you could have a way of looking at the world that was, there's a lot of conspiracy thinking for example but why does it make it more powerful to have it um, resemble the anti-Semitic version of that, or even to make the Jews part of that? So it's not subtle the way the Putin civilizational divide or the contemporary church uh, identifies the West with the, with the Jews. It's, a, it's easily read as, so what is it that makes, and here, this is kind of a philosophical almost question which I like to avoid. Um, and I don't like, I, there are two things I don't like about thinking about anti-Semitism. It was there from the beginning, it was always there, it always will be there, it's some permanent feature of, what, Western civilizations? And the other thing I really don't like is the other, some psychological mechanism where you always have, in order to define yourself, there has to be someone who isn't you, and again, it doesn't answer the question, why does it have to be the Jew? Um, unless you say it's the Christian civilization is the premise and then the Jew has to be. These two theories of anti-Semitism, which a lot of intelligent people work with, I personally find not very useful and maybe because I'm a historian. It's a really good question. Um, one is tempted to say that there is this kind of basic element in Western culture that is, sees the Jews in this position all the time and so it's easy to read the West is Jewish or this, and I, I think that's what you're asking. Is yeah. that? We have one last question. Hello. You hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. Um, it, uh, sometimes uh, it uh, appeared to me that uh, being a Jew in the Soviet Union is something of a monolithic structure, yeah? Um, but uh, I have some experience with uh, you Jews coming here in Vienna from Bukhara in Uzbekistan. Yeah? They are Very an ethnic point. completely different yes. from uh, the Russian uh, Eastern Jews. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, so uh, what is interesting to see is what it makes, that is a question which is also treated in other um, speeches here uh, at the conference, yeah? uh, to make a singular people or the structure out of a quite diverse ethnic uh, complexity. I, I think it's a wonderful question and let me just reframe it so we can, we can conclude. Okay, sure. I think I started by saying that it was a mental construct um, uh, in which 
a fantasy of Jews. It doesn't matter if the Jews are all different. It's not about actual Jews, anti-Semitism as a worldview. It's about the idea of the Jew. They can be very different. And the other answer to your question is, what is a Jew? And Tzvi Gittelman has written a very interesting book on Jews in the post-Soviet world. And he says, this is a history in which Jews were marked Jewish on their passport. They were not allowed to pursue Jewish culture. Many of them know nothing about Jewish culture. Many of them don't actually, and we're not even getting to the question of Bukharan Jews and other kinds of Jews with their own separate cultures. Um, what does it mean to be Jewish? And, and this is, so I'm using this word irresponsibly in relationship to the actual people with some relationship to a Jewish identity who lived in what had been the Soviet Union. There are many, as there is in the rest of the world, many different ways of being Jewish, of feeling Jewish, or being identified from the outside as Jewish. And when we talk about the Jews in relation to anti-Semitism, we're talking about uh, an image or an idea or a uh, trope or a fantasy that has some connection to actual Jews, but it is not a direct, it's not a descriptive. I would answer your question that way. And I think that's, that's an incredibly far-reaching and important point, and that, that makes it both interesting and hard to be a historian of these topics, because there's a constant automatic conflation between the categories and, and what we could call discourse and actual people and their experiences. Um, but there's still a little bit of optimism here, because we're, we're hope and despair. We're, we're like a little, little hopeful. Okay, I'm a little hopeful about Russia as well as despaired. <laughs> because it was wonderful that the communist regime ended, in my opinion. Um, I was a big fan of the end of communism. I'm not a big fan of what happened after communism, but there's still elements there to work with. There's still something that looks like it is a developing or existing civil society. I'm still using these antiquated categories that nowadays I say, oh, why are we still talking like a liberal? Oh, I really can't help it. I think this, there's still, I, I'll give an anecdote. I was in Berlin this summer and I had a conversation with a young Russian woman, a biologist, um, and I said, where are you from? She said, I'm from Moscow, the city of protests. <laughs> I, thought, I thought this was great. So I, I feel like all That's is not wonderful. lost. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Please enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you so much, Laura, and uh, please come again.